And I said to myself, what the hell just happened? And how come I'm still alive? How come I'm still alive? I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, is there a history of military service in your family? All, all the family. My father was in the First World War. My brother was in the Army, and my young brother was in the Marine Corps. What did your brother do in the first, or your father do in the First World War? He never got overseas. He never got overseas? He didn't afford decks for the whole year. Was he drafted, or did he, did he uh, sign up? No, at that time, he was a volunteer, yeah. Volunteer? So why did you join the service? When did I go to the service? Why, what was your reason for going to the service? <clears throat> the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. At that time, everybody wanted to do their part, you know. So I was in my senior year in high school, and 17 of us left the school year, and we all volunteered who were in the Army, who were in the Navy, who were in the Coast Guard, yeah. Okay, so why did you join the Coast Guard? <laughs> I first volunteered for the Air Force as a belly gunner, you know, the, the gunner. Of the, and I took all the tests, and I failed because of peripheral vision. So then I joined the Navy. I passed all the tests they wanted. And they said, fine, come back in six weeks. I wanted to go immediately. So next door was the Coast Guard. That's how I became a Coast Guard. Where did you go for the training for the Coast Guard? Where was it, the training? Manhattan Beach in New York. Oh, Manhattan, so it was, you basically stayed home? Yeah. So, awesome, Manhattan Beach in New York. How was that? It's good. Your training? Good. Six weeks of hell. <laughs> you know, you were in the, your jewel slides, you remember? <laughs> you know what they do? They knock you down so they can build you up. That's the thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what ship were you assigned to once training finished? What well, ship did you go to? USS Samuel Chase. Can you tell me about how, how, how it was on the ship and what your job was? My job, originally, I was a gunner's mate. I was in charge of four 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns on the stern of the ship. But during invasions, I was on the Higgins boat going into the beach. So the Coast Guard now and the Coast Guard back then, what was the Coast Guard's mission? The, the, it was all amphibious at the time. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't like guarding New York. You were actually you were actually over in Europe. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. After six weeks, they sent me over to Europe. And when I joined the Coast Guard, my mother was very happy. She thought I'd be patrolling the beaches on Coney Island. <laughs> six weeks later, I was on my way to Europe. Did you tell her where you were? Hmm? Did you tell her? What, did you tell your mother where you were? Yeah, I told her. You know. When I originally signed up uh, at 17, my mom had to sign a release. She wouldn't sign. She said, when you fill this high school, I'll sign. But I left high school. I, I wanted to get into it. So when did you head over to England? When did I go to England? Six weeks after boot camp. Do you remember what year? Do you remember what year that was? Uh, it was 1943. I don't remember the date, though. OK. What were, so let's, do you remember D-Day? I was there doing D-Day. D-Day. What were the preparations like for D-Day in England? <clears throat> well, we did maneuvers day in and day out, day in and day out, in Virginia Beach down, like Norfolk. And then, uh, you know, we had 1,200 troops aboard my ship, from the Big Red One, the first division. And uh, the day of the invasion, we made a big mistake. We fed the troops bacon and eggs and everything you could think of. That was a big mistake. If you, if you know anything about going in battle, the Russians used to go in battle with a hard tack and a glass of water or something like that. We overfed the troops. It was the worst thing we could ever do because they all got seasick, every one of them. 
Do you remember what you were thinking when you discovered that D-Day was about to happen? <laughs> I was scared. I was scared because I knew there was going to be a lot of casualties on the beach. And we ended up with 2,000 casualties on my beach, Omaha Beach. We were the worst of the five, the five stars. We were the worst. Omaha Beach was the worst. Do you remember what you've seen as you were approaching Omaha Beach? What it looked like? Mm -hmm. Do you remember what it looked like and what you've seen when you were approaching Omaha Beach? Yeah, of course I, look, I know what it looked like. At uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, we started dropping our boats in the water. We had 26 Higgins boats. You know what Higgins boat is, right? Yeah. We had 26 boats. We circled the ship one time, supposed to be good luck, and we headed towards the, uh, the beaches. We were 11 miles out because the Germans had a gun called the 88, which is the best gun in the war, and had a range of 10 miles. So all the transports were 11 miles out, which is very good for them, not for us, because it took us two hours to get to the beach. And in the water, going to the beach, were mines made out of glass or plastic, and you could hardly see them in the water, you know. A couple of boats, not from my ship, but a couple of boats hit the mines, and they got killed. Yeah. Do you remember what the soldiers were saying as they got closer to the German gunfire? You got to say that again. Do you remember what some of the soldiers were saying as they, they can hear and got closer to the, the soldiers? Yeah, what they were saying when they got closer uh, to the gunfire? You know, gunfire. they didn't realize they were going to their death. They were singing and talking and laughing, telling jokes until they got fired at. Didn't the mood, like, suddenly change once they saw the <clears throat> We couldn't get on the beach. You know, Higgins Boat was on the beach. We couldn't get on the beach because there was obstacles in the water. You know, these coarse beams with metal. And it was mine. And along the beach, the Germans had 33 machine guns, M M42s. It, it fires 160 rounds per minute. So my job originally, I'm a gunner's mate. So I was supposed to be posting a machine gun on the boat. You in the service? You know how they act? You know what they do? About three or four weeks before the invasion, they took my gun away. If you ask me why, I don't know. So consequently, instead of the machine guns, they gave me the job of dropping the ramp. You know, in the front of the boat. The boat is made out of wood. But in the front of the boat, they have this ramp like a garage door ramp, and it's made of two or three inch metal. So it can withstand, withstand either a rifle or a machine gun. So when we got close enough to the beach, we only go about 200 yards from the beach, that's, that's the closest we could get. And the machine guns opened fire on us, and uh, the bullets were bouncing off the ramp, because it was metal, it was up. But I knew eventually I had to drop the ramp. And then the boats, instead of hitting the ramp, they would come into the boat. So the coxswain says to me, drop the ramp. I never heard him, because the roar of the cannons, two big diesel engines in the back of the boat, I never heard him. Then the second time he says to me, drop the ramp. And I froze for a few seconds, because I didn't want to die. And I knew once I dropped that ramp, I buzzed. And then he said to me, he says, God damn, DeVita dropped the effing ramp. So I had no choice. I dropped the ramp. The machine guns opened up fire. Killed about 14, 15 troops that were in the front of the boat. Now, my, where I was, there was a crank that lowered and raised the ramp. I was about three quarters of the way back. You know anything about uh, basketball? Yeah. You know what pick is? Yes. Well, I had soldiers in front of me. They were my pick. They were absorbing the bullets oh, that would come to me, you know. But I had two stragglers. They didn't want to die, so they didn't want to get the other troops to go on forward. They stayed with me. They thought by staying with me, they'd be safe. 
unfortunately, by staying with me, they were drawn fire from the hills. Didn't help me. Two guys. One guy was about four feet away from me. The other guy was about two feet away from me. The first guy got hit, ripped his stomach open. His stomach's outside his belly. Fortunately, he lived. This guy lived. And the other guy that was two feet away from me, he was a red-headed kid. The machine gun took his helmet off and part of his, his brain, a part of it. And he was crying, help me, help me, help me. I had no morphine, I couldn't help him. So he fell at my feet. Excuse me if I get an emotion. He, he fell at my feet and he was crying, help me, help me, help me. I had nothing in my kit to help him. So the only thing I had was the Lord's Prayer. And I started praying, Our oh, Father, who art in heaven. I, I never finished it. Then he slumped down. I knew he, I knew he was going to die. And I reached down and I squeezed his hand. I want him to know that he wasn't alone. Then he died. He died. He was just a little boy, just a little boy. So the, the coxswain says, pick up the ramp because we're getting a lot of flack from the hills and from the machine guns on the beach. So he says to me, raise the ramp. So I pulled the handle, the ramp would not go up. Pulled it a second time, the ramp would not go up. So I put it on auto, wouldn't go up. So my job, there was probably maybe 15 guys still alive on that boat. My job was to protect these guys with, with, with the ramp. So I, I couldn't see the ramp from where I was because of all the dead bodies in front of me. So I had to do something I didn't want to do. I was crawling over the dead bodies and asking them for, my, for them for forgiveness. They were dead. And I'm saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So I climbed over the dead bodies and I started going through the ramp. And all of a sudden, one guy came out. I don't know if he was a crew member or army. I didn't care, so I had some help. So when we got to the, close enough to the beach, I wanted to know why the ramp wouldn't go up. There was two dead soldiers. They never got out of the boat. And they were on the ramp. It plus the weight of the soldiers. And each soldier had 90 pounds on his backpack. So the ramp would not go up. So, this other guy and myself, I pointed to his belt, and we grabbed his belt, and by step by step by step, we pulled him into the, the two boys that were dead, into the boat. Then he says to me, raise the ramp. So without the two guys, when I had it on a pilot, it came up by itself anyhow. So, you know, the Germans are very diabolical. They know how to kill people. Besides the mines and the machine guns, they're telephone poles. On top of the telephone pole was a mine. It wasn't screwed in or nailed in. It was just sitting there. So if you happen to tap the telephone pole, that mine would come in your boat. We were scared of the telephone poles. So anyhow, the, cox, the coxswain was with me. He was a little kid from uh, Brooklyn, New York, Derman. And uh, he got out of it, because don't forget, he had, he had to go backwards through these mines, through these telephone poles. 
we turned the boat around and we started heading towards my boat. My captain was very smart, which he, each wave, he came a little close to the shore, a little close to the shore. So we headed for my boat, my ship rather, and then we saw this white ship with a big red cross on it. It's a hospital ship. So instead of going to our ship, we went to the hospital ship. Because we had a lot of wounded aboard, badly wounded. And when we got to the hospital ship, there was a ramp on the back. And two guys from the hospital ship, God bless them, they jumped into my boat. And they did something we couldn't do. They were peeling the dead off to get to the wounded. I, I don't remember exactly. I was like in a little shock at that time. I don't remember if they got five, six, I don't know how many. But they got these guys and they put them in a hospital ship. At least they were going to live. They, you know, they, they had wheelchairs. They, they had morphine. They had everything on the hospital ship. And I, I was happy that these guys are going to get all the care they needed. So then these two guys jumped out of the boat. We pulled it away from the hospital ship. And we headed towards my ship. On the back of my ship, they had dropped a sled. A sled is like a garage door, a big garage door. And we would put the dead and wounded on there, and then the crank would take them aboard ship. So somebody yelled through a klaxon horn, I want one man from each boat to come up to be interviewed, or not interviewed, because he figured maybe we could help the next wave. So I got aboard the sled and I went up and, and I was interviewed by a, a Navy, Navy guy and a big Army guy. That guy had hands as big as a baseball mitt. And he did something. Like I said, I was in shock. He did something. He tapped me on the shoulder. He said, it's all right. It's all right, son. It was like a hug. Like a hug. So I was interviewed with him. And then this army guy said to me, he says, son, let me teach you something. He said, those machine guns can only fire for so long. Then they burn, they get hot. And they got to change, change the barrels. When they change the barrels, that's when you drop the ramp. So I said to him, how much time do I have? Two to three seconds to change the barrel. So that's what I did. So then, after I was interviewed, see, my boat already had pulled away to 28. So I'm waiting for another boat. And I'm standing on deck, and nobody's around me because I stunk to high heaven. My uniform was covered with blood and puke. So I'm standing by myself, and I said to myself, do I want to go back into the belly of the beast and face those machine guns? I didn't want to die. So I thought about it for a while, and I said to myself, if I don't go, they're going to send a replacement. Suppose a replacement gets killed. How could I live with myself? So I made up my mind, I'm going back. And I went back 14 more times. 14 more times. I made 15 trips all together. The Germans owned the beach. The Germans owned the beach, not us. And they were slaughtering the troops left and right from the hills and from the ground. From the ground. These, these poor guys, they had no chance. You know, it, it was flat like a, like a pool table. No place to hide. You can't dig in sand. And, and they were getting killed so fast. So 
I, like I said, I was a little bit of a shock. So anyhow, the uh, coxswain says, the Vita took up the ramp. We're getting flat coming in on both sides. Let's get the hell out of here. So I try to pick up the ramp. Like I told you before, the ramp would not go down that door. So we went back to my ship. And that's when I was all, all along, right? There was five destroyers all along, but the, the lead destroyer was the Frankfurt. And then one or two other destroyers, the Sadley was there and the McGook. So the three of them came in at the same time. But the Frankfurt, you know you were a soldier, you know what it is. When you attack an enemy, you attack his nose because there's a smallest silhouette. He did that, and he came so close to shore. You know, our boats can go on a beach. A destroyer has a keel. They can't get too close. He was in sand. So then he did something I've never seen done before. This guy was willing to sacrifice his life and his boat and all his men because he wanted to help these guys on the beach. So he took his boat that was facing this way and he turned it sideways, exposing his beam to the 88s. The reason he did that, a destroyer has four five-inch guns. He wanted to fire these five-inch guns at one time. Now the guys up on the hill that were facing us and machine guns, 88s up there. We couldn't see them, they were in the grass, foliage and stuff like that. So we, he put a round of his five inch gun, four at a time, and he took out those guys on the, on, on the slope. And right then there, the battle started changing. Now, that's the fifth way. Don't forget, we were four transports going in. Each transport had 1,200 men. So we had a lot of men going into that beach. By the end of it, by the end of, after the Allies had taken the beach, what were you thinking at the end of the day? When the, I'm scared was, shit. Scared shit still? Uh, I didn't want to die. Right. What did you do in the days after the invasion? After the invasion? It's a good question. I gotta go back to the fifth wave to, to bring you up to date on this. By the fifth wave, we ran out of troops. So we started taking the 29th Division because the 29th Division was on Utah and Utah at that time was clean. So they swung over to help the first division. That's the first five. We ran out of troops, and we had to do something else. Instead of going into the beach, we started to take the dead and the wounded off the beach. We had to get in the water. I weighed 125 pounds. I couldn't lift one of these guys up. So two or three of us we got. And we put them in the boat. We started going back to my ship. Now, I don't know how many wounded we took to my ship, but I do know that we took 308 dead bodies. Why do I know that? Because I had a good friend of mine, John Ola, who was a quartermaster, and his job was to put the bodies in the body bags, and he dispensed 308 dead body bags. So, so now they brought my boat up. I don't remember what boat it was because the 28 was gone. They brought my boat up and I looked at that boat. It looked like Swiss cheese. The machines had decimated it. And I'm saying to myself, how, how the hell did anybody live off that boat, right? So I, I got aboard ship, I, I bought the ship, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And the captain was so good for it. His name was Captain Fritsch. 
he understood what we, what we had gone through. So after we took these 300 dead bodies and the, the wounded, I don't know how many wounded we were, we started going back to Southampton. That was the home base. And we went to Southampton. I want to backtrack a little bit. When I'm aboard the ship and we're going towards Southampton, I'm all by myself. They announce over the loudspeaker, there's cheese sandwiches and coffee for the crews that went into the beach. So everybody went down to the mess hall. I didn't want to go. First of all, I stunk to heaven, high heaven. And I didn't want him to see my cry. I didn't want him to see me cry. So I walked back to my 20 millimeter guns and I sat down and I'm reflecting. And I said to myself, what the hell just happened? And how come I'm still alive? How come I'm still alive? So it was a wet deck. It was probably 10, 11 o'clock. I forget the time. And I'm all alone. And I looked around to see if any of my mates were with me. Nobody was there. But when I turned around, all the dead bodies, the 308 dead, dead bodies, like a quarter wood, I started to cry. And I cried myself to sleep. And the next morning when we pulled into Southampton, somebody tapped me on the shoulder. I think it was Lieutenant Gruber, I'm not sure. He said, the, the Vita, get up. We have to unload the dead and the, then the wounded. And really, that's the end of my story. That's the end of my story. So after Southampton, what else did you do on? Uh, my home base was Glasgow, Scotland. Glasgow, Scotland. We went up to Glasgow, Scotland. What more did you do until you came home? Like, Before I came home? Yeah. I made two more invasions. Two more invasions back in yeah. France? Yeah, I made the invasion of southern France and the Philippines. So I had three battle stars. In the Philippines, so that was your time in the Pacific? In the Pacific, yeah. Was it similar to D-Day? <laughs> You know, no, it wasn't as bad. But you know, after all the horror of the two invasions in France, we thought we were going home. Then they announced over the loudspeakers, get your gear in order, we're going to the Pacific. And I didn't make the actual invasion of the uh, Philippine Islands, but we did bring replacement troops into the Philippines. So we got credit for an invasion. And then from there, we went up to Okinawa. And I was in Okinawa when the kamikazes came over. And the, the kamikazes would sink a boat after boat. They didn't want my boat. My boat was only a transport. They wanted the destroyers and the aircraft carriers. That's what they aimed at. So the, after the kamikazes left, I, I had there twice. When the kamikaze twice, I was there. Then we went back to uh, Pearl Harbor. And on the way to Pearl Harbor, we had a coral reef. And we put a 17-foot gash in the hull of the ship. You know the Titanic, the reason they sank? The they didn't close the hatches. So our guys, especially trained for that, they closed the hatches on this one place where the water was coming in. And the boat was tilting like this. So they gave us two destroyers to, to get as far as Pearl Harbor. No, no, not Pearl Harbor, Okinawa. Okinawa, yeah. Excuse me, the Philippines, Philippines because the Philippines had a dry dock. And they took our ship, put it in the dry, we had to wait our turn. 
they put in the dry dock and they put a patch. They couldn't put the whole hole up. So we left there and we started to come to Pearl. We went to Pearl and the destroyers were still with us. And after Pearl, we started going home to the United States. And we went to San Diego. <laughs> Can I put a little humor in this? Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, they put our, dry, our ship in dry dock. They're going to put a new hole, hole. So I had a friend of mine who lived right near the shipyard. And I said to him, I'm going to go AWOL, but I want you to call me. If they come out of dry dock, I'll come back. So the train didn't leave from San Diego. It left from San Francisco. So I took a bus to San Diego, I mean, to San Francisco. I got on the troop train that was going to the United States, called the Silver Streak. All Army guys and Navy guys, a lot of them wounded, had no papers. But thankfully, nobody asked for papers. So I get home. I, I, I run to my, my house was about a, a mile and a half from the subway where I got off. I ran all the way home. I wanted to see my mother. My father was at work. My brother was away. My kid brother was in school. I didn't know what to do. I said, went next door. The woman's name was Mrs. Barsha. And I said, Mrs. Barsha, where's my mother? Have something to eat. You know how tired you are. Have something to eat. I said, no, I can't. Where's my mother? She's at the church rolling bandages. So I ran to the church. It was about a mile, mile and a half away. And I opened the door. It was like a big gymnasium. And I'm facing these women. They were in a big circle. My mother had her back to me. But the people who were looking at me, they were going like that, you know. My mother didn't know what's going on. She turned around, she saw me, fainted that away. I thought I killed my mother. I thought I killed my mother. So anyhow, we went home, my mother called the whole army. Frank is home, Frank is home, Frank is home. So I'm home for two weeks. You know, you don't get two weeks leave. My father was in the army in the First World War. He said to me, he says, you know, you're home a long time. Let me see your papers. I said, Pop, I don't have any papers. I'm all AWOL. Get in the car, took me to Grand Central Station. First train back to San Francisco. I had to wait for the first train. So I'm waiting for the train with my father. And there was two MPs. My father walks over to the MPs. He said, you see that kid over there? That's my son. He's AWOL. But he's going back. <laughs> he threw me on the train, under the bus. <laughs> my own father. So the MPs came over. And he says, this is what we're going to do. When the train comes in, if you're on the train, we won't do anything. If you don't get on the train, we're going to pull you in. I got on the train. I went back. It was still the dry dock. I went back to my ship. And that's the end of my story. Wow. That's an awesome story. Um, that's one of the best ones I've heard <laughs> since uh, interviewing veterans, for sure. Um, and let me tell you something. If somebody in battle says they weren't scared, they were scared. They were scared. Oh, yeah. They're lying. You got you to gotta be scared. You know, I, I, I was on the, on the boat with the machine gun. I had machine gun bullets like a swarm of angry bees. One guy went down. The other guy went down. Is the next one mine? You, you're scared. Yeah. 76 years later, um, what is, who or what do you think about when you think of, you know, Say that again. Who do you, what, what is it that you think about 
um, about D-Day, 76, 76, 76 years uh, later. I relive it every day of my life. Every day? Yeah. Not the other battles. D-Day was the worst. Is there one thing that, that sticks in your mind the most? D-Day, yeah. I mean, when I left after the 15th trip in, there was 2,000 dead bodies on the beach. 2,000. You gotta be scared. Anybody tells you they're not scared, they're lying. Yeah. What are you most proud of during your time in the service? Mm -hmm. What are you most proud of during your time? In the Th that I served and I helped get rid of Hitler and Hirohito. Because they were so bad. They, they were so bad. Yeah. Well, Mr. DeVita, thank you so much for being with us. And okay, before I go, I just want to tell you something. I'm not a hero. A lot of people call me a hero. I'm not a hero. I'm a survivor. There's a cemetery up. You ever been to France? I haven't been to France. I haven't been to France. I've been to Germany. There's a cemetery up in France in Normandy. Omaha Beach overlooks the cemetery. In that cemetery is 9,400 kids in the ground. Those are my heroes. They gave their life for their country. They were my heroes. And that's what she wrote. And if you think it's over, it's never over. Were you in combat? Don't you think of that law all quite often? The combat medic and our MRAP blew up. Very scared. I mean, in Iraq, you go along, along, you hit a mine, you got no more legs. Yeah. It shakes me up every day today still. You can just be bumping on. They say. Move my mind a little bit. They say you leave the war, but the war never leaves you. No. Yeah. But I'm proud of what I did. I'm very proud. I probably did more in the three years that I was bored, bored the ship than a lot of people ever did. You know, two invasions, and then the Philippines, Okinawa, then I'd end up in Japan. I was in the occupation of Japan for about eight months. Yeah. When I was in Japan, a little Japanese woman, about five feet tall, she walked up to me, first day bow like this, and then she says, I want to thank you. I said, why are you thanking me? She said, the war's over. You know? It's the big people who make wars, not the common people. They're the ones who get hurt. Yeah. 